Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mikiko Takeda, an associate professor at the University of New Mexico College of Pharmacy. Today's presentation topic is neuropathic pain. Here are learning objectives of today's lecture. At the end of this lecture, you will be able to differentiate first-line treatment agent and other treatment options for neuropathic pain and identify patient-specific factors for the selection of medication to treat neuropathic pain. Here is a case. PK, a 58-year-old male, came to your clinic today for his pain assessment. He has a long history of diabetes. So my questions for you are, how would you assess his pain? And what would be the best treatment option for him? The prevalence of neuropathic pain is about 1 to 8% of adult population. Neuropathic pain is associated with various conditions such as diabetes, herpes zoster or shingles, or surgery. When it comes to neuropathic pain, there are two types of neuropathic pain. One is peripheral neuropathic pain syndrome and the other one is central neuropathic pain syndrome. Patients with peripheral neuropathic pain syndrome have nerve damage on peripheral nervous system. Here are examples of peripheral neuropathic pain syndrome. It is common that a patient with diabetes have diabetic peripheral polyneuropathy. Some chemotherapy agents could cause chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And nerve damage due to surgery could cause post-surgical chronic neuropathic pain. Patients with central neuropathic pain syndrome have nerve damage on the central nervous system. In other words, they have nerve damage in the brain or spinal cord. Here are examples of central neuropathic pain syndrome. In this lecture, I would like to focus on peripheral neuropathy. The main symptom of neuropathic pain is, of course, pain. So when you ask patient about their pain, uh, they said they have numbness and tingling, or they have burning sensation, and the pain is described as pins and needles, or shooting pain or electric shock-like pain. Uh, when we assess uh, the patient pain condition, uh, you need to do phys uh, physical examination, especially uh, neurological examination. So when you assess patient uh, sensation, you would know that uh, patient have abnormal sensation. Most likely the uh, sensation is decreased. So when you assess pain sensation, probably you would use a safety pin and then assess a uh, sharp pain or dull pain. And then light touch sensation, uh, you may use cotton ball or Q-tips and then assess whether patient can react to the really slight sensation. And the temperature, um, vibration, uh, you may use tuning forks. And usually the tuning forks is cold and then um, place the tuning fork on a patient's skin. And then you need to assess whether patient can uh, identify whether it's cold or hot. So uh, uh, as well as vibration. So uh, this is a uh, algorithm of pain management, especially for neuropathic pain. So there are four steps. The initial step is uh, patient assessment and establishment of a treatment plan. So as we discussed, we can utilize physiological examination and then uh, establish a treatment plan. So which medication or which treatment patient should uh, go on and also, um, the most important thing is establish a realistic treatment goal. And then the step two is uh, the initiation of the therapy. So once you choose a medication, uh, 
you may use uh, the titration technique or if patient is not uh, respond to medication, uh, well, yeah, initiation of the therapy. Yes, yeah, so you need to select uh, a best medication and then start the therapy. And step three is uh, reassessment of pain and treatment. So you need to assess whether uh, treatment would be appropriate for the patient, whether patient uh, experiences any side effect. And then uh, step four is consideration or initiation of other treatment options. So you can combine pharmacotherapy option and non-pharmacotherapy option. Okay, so uh, when we assess pain, um, we need to assess those items. Uh, first, quality and the quantity of the pain. So for the quality of the pain, you can ask patient what uh, kind of pain the patient has. Namely, you can assess the characteristics of patient pain and location, whether the pain is localized or patient has a um, large area of pain. And uh, for pharmacist, this is so important to ask whether patient already tried any pharmacotherapy options. So um, for example, if patient uh, tried one medication and if patient was responded to that medication or patient uh, experienced any adverse reactions from uh, that medication. And then, uh, modifying factors, what makes pain better or what makes pain worse. And then uh, if possible, identify the ideology of the pain. And then uh, about daily activities, sorry, th this part should be under here, but uh, so daily activities uh, because of the pain, how the pain interfere with patient daily activities and also about medical history and comorbidities. So for example, diabetes. So how long patient has that comorbidity? And if the condition is well treated or um, uh, patient still has some issues with uh, diabetes and mental status. So this is so important because um, the comorbidity is uh, closely related to the selection of the best treatment option. And then about diagnosis and treatment plan. So of course we need to identify uh, the accurate diagnosis. And then in order to do accurate diagnosis, uh, probably uh, you can order imaging or you can provide physical examination. And then uh, also uh, we need to review the current treatment plan and then utilize guideline and also consider uh, patient specific factors to identify the best treatment option. So uh, when we assess patient uh, pain quality and quantity, so for the quality wise, we use basic seven or OPQRST or scholar mark. So uh, who uh, uses basic seven to identify the patient pain condition? Yeah, so to me, uh, it's easy to use basic seven because it's so easy to remember. Uh, for example, location, uh, qu quality of the pain, quantity using pain scale, and setting, timing, moderating factors, and associated symptoms. Then uh, quantity of the pain, usually we use pain scale. So uh, I usually use pain scale from uh, zero to 10. And have you ever uh, asked that question? So what is your pain scale? And then um, have, you, uh, have your patient said, oh, my pain is 20 out of 10? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I had the same situation. So before I ask patient pain scale, I usually said, okay, so zero out of 10 pain means no pain at all. And then 10 out of 10 pain means 
uh, you have the worst pain that you can imagine. Otherwise, patient would say, my pain is 12 out of 10 or 20 out of 10. Yeah. So um, here, oh, sorry, before we move on. Okay, so uh, usually we call one to three out of 10, uh, pain would be mild and four to six would be moderate and above seven would be severe pain. So uh, I like this. <laughs> yeah, so especially I use this uh, pain scale uh, when I ask students after uh, my exam. <laughs> So what is your pain now? And some students uh, picked up two serious phone numbers. Yeah, so this is cute. And th I think this is kind of more realistic. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the comorbidities. So um, just going back to the initial case, uh, the patient has diabetes. So uh, the reason why disease state or concomitant diseases would be important is sometimes uh, the underlying disease condition can exacerbate the pain. So recently I had a patient uh, who has type two diabetes and uh, really severe neuropathic pain. So I just wondered uh, if the patient diabetes control would be okay or bad because patient pain uh, condition got worse. So uh, I reviewed patient information and it says about six months ago, hemoglobin A1C was about, uh, around 10. So obviously the uh, diabetes was not well controlled. And then I ordered hemoglobin A1C and um, can you guess how was that? <laughs> 14, close. Yeah, it was 16. Yeah, so her diabetes was uh, not well controlled. So uh, I contacted her primary care uh, provider and then assess uh, diabetes condition more closely. So anyways, yeah, uh, the better glucose control uh, can bring the better uh, treatment outcomes for neuropathic pain. And then also if the patient has diabetes, I usually avoid uh, TCAs because TCA could increase the carbohydrate intake. Not always, but I'm concerned about that. And also I would avoid valproic acid because valproic acid could uh, increase uh, the weight. So it, and then if patient has a hypertension, I would avoid the medication which could um, interfere with uh, patient blood pressure. So for the diagnosis, again, uh, we can order imaging, physical examination, and also we can do mental assessment to uh, have the accurate diagnosis. And finally, treatment plan. So as we discussed previously, uh, we can combine pharmacotherapy options and um, no pharmacotherapy options. So how about the treatment goals? It should be uh, realistic. So uh, probably you had the same situation like me, but the patient expected that medication is the last solution to be pain-free, but actually that's not true. So whenever I talk with my patient, uh, I said, well, medication is a part of the treatment. And then um, there are some other options to treat um, patient pain. So uh, when it comes to establishing the realistic uh, treatment goal, I usually ask patient to focus on um, what kind of work would you like to be if the pain is alleviated. So what kind of exercise would you like to do? For example, 30 minutes uh, walk without any uh, interfere. And how about uh, daily activities? How about social interactions? So those questions are really important. Okay. So we already talked about some of them. Yeah. 
So sometimes we use pain scale to establish the treatment goal. So now your pain scale is uh, like six out of 10. So uh, what do you think if your pain is three out of 10, something like that? So when it comes to pharmacotherapy, the ideal pain medication is uh, the medication which could provide adequate pain control, which means efficacy, and also uh, can bring functional status. So we always need to think about the efficacy and adverse reaction or patient safety at the same time. So I wanna talk about uh, pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics and how uh, PK or PD could uh, affect the selection of the medications. So by the way, uh, the definition of pharmacokinetics is uh, PK, uh, how a drug works in the body. And then pharmacodynamics, uh, how the body reacts to the drug. So uh, those are the definitions. So when it comes to PK pharmacokinetics, uh, we usually review those four components, A, D, M, E. So absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion or elimination. So absorptions, um, first of all, drug formulation. So IR means uh, immediate release formulation and ER means extended release formulation. So uh, we need to determine which would be more appropriate for patient considering patient medication adherence. And then administration route, PO uh, by mouth uh, versus parenteral. Uh, so uh, other route, for example, per rectal, IV, IM, or transdermal. And then distribution. So uh, once patient takes medication, it goes to uh, all over the body, but uh, we need to make sure whether the medication can go through blood brain barrier or go through first pass effect. And then metabolism. So this is important when you think about the drug drug instructions. So usually uh, the medication is metabolized by the liver, uh, uh, in the liver by uh, isoenzymes like CYP enzymes. And then uh, we need to make sure if patient uh, liver function is okay. If patient liver uh, LFT is elevated, we need to adjust the dosage. And also metabolites. Um, for example, uh, like I said, medication is metabolized in the liver by the enzyme. So here, amitriptyline. So amitriptyline is metabolized uh, by CYP2C19, and it's metabolized to null uh, triptyline. And then excretion or elimination. So uh, like hepatic function, we need to check renal function. So if patient renal function is not well, and then uh, again, we need to adjust the dosage. So for PD, pharmacodynamics, uh, we need to uh, pay attention to the onset of action of the medication, uh, peak effect, uh, and the duration of the action. So for uh, pharmacotherapy tips, of course, we need to apply our basic knowledge on pharmacotherapy. So uh, we need to understand the efficacy and adverse reactions of uh, the therapeutic agents, and again, we need to review patient medication history. So whether patient tried uh, what medication and uh, the reaction to the medication and uh, consider concomitant disease state and the physiolo uh, physiological conditions for drug of choice. So uh, we need to treat underlying uh, cause or underlying disease state. And then uh, if patient has some comorbidities, uh, we talked about um, diabetes and also uh, how about cardiac function? How about the hepatic function, liver function, uh, and the renal function? So this is the alg uh, treatment algorithm for neuropathic pain. 
Okay. So uh, first, I would like to talk about the first line medications. So those are TCA, uh, SNRIs, antidepressants, and calcium channel ligands, uh, gabapentin or pregabalin, and topicals uh, such as capsaicin, topical, and lidocaine topical. So those are considered as a first line treatment agent. So you can choose one of them considering patient concomitant disease state. And then if patients react to those medications, well, you can just continue that regimen and uh, you can do those adjustment. So if a patient tried one medication from the first line medication, and a patient already did four to six week trial, but a patient doesn't respond to that medication. So in that case, you can try another first line agent and repeat the dose adjustment. And then if that doesn't work, the second uh, line treatment options are combination therapy of first line medications or move to tramadol, the weak opioid medication. Then if it doesn't work, uh, the next step is refer the patient to a pain specialist. Oh, sorry. Yeah, refer the patient to a pain specialist. And at the same time, uh, we could try SSRI, anticonvulsants, NMDA receptor antagonist, and then uh, the fourth line treatment is uh, neuromodulation. And finally, fifth line treatment in this uh, uh, recommendation, it says we could try low dose opioid. So later we are going to talk about um, low dose opioid for neuropathic pain. And then lastly, uh, target drug del delivery. So this is a specific uh, drug delivery and um, the method is to deliver the drug to uh, drug directly to the affected area. For example, uh, spinal cord. So uh, uh, today's talk, I would like to focus on the first line medications and second line medications. So um, just for your information, this is the French uh, guideline. It's very similar. So the first line uh, treatment option would be lidocaine, and then uh, oral medications are SNRIs, uh, gabapentin, tricyclic antidepressants, second line uh, capsaicin or Botox injections, and then uh, pregabalin, tramadol, or combination therapy. So this is the overview of pharmacotherapy. So it shows uh, where the medication works. So uh, the light, uh, left side shows A sending pathway and the right side shows D sending pathway. Okay. So uh, let's move on to uh, step two, init initiation of the therapy. So, uh, for pharmacotherapy, the gold standard is start slow and go slow. So the reason is if you set up the target dosage and start that dosage right away, it's really difficult for patient to tolerate with that dosage. Yeah, for example, gabapentin, if uh, you'd like to start like 900 milligrams three times a day, patient is not able to tolerate it. So patient feels uh, uh, bad side effect, including uh, extremely uh, sedated. So um, we need to start uh, with low dose and then increase the dose slowly. So here are first line medications, uh, gabapentin, uh, regular release, and gabapentin extended release formulation. Um, so for extended release formulation, um, this has the FDA indication of post-herpetic neuralgia in adults. And pregabalin, uh, duloxetine, venlafaxine, and TCAs. 
So the dosage of TCAs are very similar to each other. And then um, the dosage is very small compared with the dosage for uh, depression. So if you start with uh, start the TCA and then increase the dosage about uh, 75 mi uh, milligram per day, but patient doesn't have any benefit from it. So in that case, um, you need to switch to other medication. And then also TCAs, uh, this is not recommended for uh, geriatric population because of the anticholinergic uh, adverse reactions, such as awful uh, static hypotension, dry mouth, and constipation. So the next medication we would like to discuss is gabapentin, okay? So even though gabapentin has GABA in the name, so it's pre gaba -lin, uh, but the mechanism of action is actually it is uh, the calcium channel ligand. So it binds to calcium channel and then decrease the calcium influx into the uh, presynaptic nerves. Uh, so the good thing about the, uh, this, medi uh, this medication is, uh, first of all, uh, it has few uh, drug drug interactions. So adverse reactions are uh, sedation, weight gain, and peripheral edema. So when patient is on uh, this medication, it's better to watch patient weight, and also uh, it's better to avoid uh, this medication for patient with uh, car, um, heart failure status. So this table shows uh, the medications, uh, gabapentin, gabapentin uh, extended release, uh, pregabalin and pregabalin control release, mechanism of action, role, dosing. Okay. Right. So the second medication is SNRIs. So this is, uh, obviously antidepressants. So the mechanism of action of this medication is a uh, block uh, reuptake of no epinephrine and serotonin. So uh, relatively this medication is well to uh, tolerated and it is safer than TCAs considering the cardiotoxicity of TCA. So the adverse reactions are sedation, uh, GI, uh, adverse reactions such as nausea, and some patients may experience insomnia or headache. So again, this table uh, summarizes uh, the medication, uh, mechanism of action, uh, FDA indication, dosage, and other information. So the next medication is TCAs. Um, so TCAs, again, we use a really small dose of TCA for neuropathic pain. And this medication is effective to treat uh, the burning pain sensation. And, so, uh, if pa and also if patient complains about uh, insomnia, it may be, uh, I mean, this medication may be a good option. Uh, because this medication can cause sedation. So take this medication at night could help with uh, the neuropathic pain and insomnia at the same time. Uh, so uh, adverse reactions, uh, anticholinergic side effects. So we already talked about uh, sedation, orthostatic hypotension, uh, weight gain, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention. So uh, this medication also has cardiotoxicity. So uh, this medication could increase uh, the QT prolongation, uh, that increase the risk of QT prolongation, and also um, sudden death. So again, this table is a summary of uh, the drug information. Okay, so the last uh, first line medication is 8% uh, capsaicin topical. 
and 5% lidocaine topical. So uh, we use these two medications for focal neuropathic pain. So that means if patient has neuropathic pain, low, uh, which is localized, so these could be a option. So uh, again, this is a summary of uh, those two medications. So uh, I have a question for you. Have you used 8% capsaicin topical? Okay. How about uh, lidocaine topical, like cream, patches? Did you have any uh, issues with insurance? Yeah, so uh, even though, <laughs> Uh, especially uh, lidocaine topical, even though this is listed as the uh, first line medication for neuropathic pain, um, insurance is the, always the issue. So even though I prescribe 5% uh, lidocaine topical, including patches, cream, recently it's really difficult to get the uh, prior authorization uh, for that product. So I usually recommend the patient to use over-the-counter lidocaine, because it's available as the over-the-counter and the cost is around $10. So again, this is a, a summary of um, the drug information. Okay, so let's move on to the second line agent. So the second line agent is uh, the combination therapy of first line medications. So gabapentinoid, uh, either gabapentin or pregabalin uh, plus TCA or uh, gabapentinoid plus SNRI. And then tramadol. So uh, tramadol, um, we can use 200 milligrams to 400 milligrams per day, but it's uh, good to know that it's better to avoid patient with seizure disorder because tramadol could, de uh, could decrease the seizure threshold. And also uh, it can increase the risk of serotonin syndrome, especially if patient is on uh, SNRI or SSRI or which could increase the serotonin level. So uh, the third line medications, uh, we have a lot of choices, uh, antidepressants such as SSRIs and anticonvulsants. So here you see carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, lacosamide, lamotrigine, pyramid, bubblic acid, and zonisamide. So those medication works as a membrane stabilizer. So those medication could block the sodium channel. And then lastly, ketamine. So uh, you see uh, how those anti-convulsant works to treat neuropathic pain as a membrane stabilizer. And then finally, opioid medications. So I would like to talk about opioid just a little bit. So if we don't have any options to treat neuropathic pain, we may use opioid. So uh, I do have some patients who are taking opioid for their neuropathic pain condition. So uh, we did our best. So we already tried uh, first line medications, uh, trials and errors, none of them worked. And also we uh, tried the combination therapy, patient was not able to tolerate with uh, that combination therapy including um, PO medications and topical medication, tramadol, nothing worked. So um, in that case, opioid may be an option. So as we saw the guideline, um, opioid was located as a fifth line therapy. And in the French guideline, it says uh, the third line uh, therapy. How about the evidence of opioid use for neuropathic pain? So uh, I reviewed several guidelines and it says insufficient data. So neither supportive or uh, against. 
So uh, in order to review the evidence of opioid use for neuropathic pain, we don't have uh, sufficient evidence. So um, the clinical studies, we uh, just reviewing the clinical studies, there are not so good clinical studies to evaluate the efficacy of opioid so as safety. So some um, clinical studies shows um, pain reduction, which is the goal of uh, the neuropathic pain treatment. But we also uh, we are concerned about uh, the safety of opioid. So as you know, opioid uh, is still our um, concern. Opioid overdose is a uh, public health issue here in the United States. So um, if we use uh, opioid medications, we do need to follow the opioid guidelines. For example, review PMP report, uh, do urine toxicology screening, and uh, prescribe naloxone. Okay, so let's talk about cannabis for uh, neuropathic pain. So I know uh, cannabis lecture is scheduled for tomorrow, right? So I just want to touch on that today. Okay, so uh, cannabis use. Um, I looked up the data at um, New Mexico Department of Health because I just wanted to know how many people have the medical cannabis card. So in October, 2012, it was only 8,000 people. So only 8,000 people have <coughs> medical cannabis card. So at that time, uh, it was only 0.4% uh, of New Mexico population. But 10 years later, I mean, March, 2022, so right now, 132,000 people carries a medical cannabis card. So that was, uh, of course, the population has been growing. So right now, this number is 6.2% of New Mexico population. Okay, so when it comes to cannabis, uh, we need to understand what kind of uh, cannabis the patient uses. First one, prescription. So there are some uh, prescription cannabis. Uh, so a good example is uh, Epidiolex, cannabidiol for uh, seizures. Yeah, so that medication is only for a specific seizure type like Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, and uh, tuberal sclerosis. And then uh, medical marijuana. And of course, recreational use. And then uh, the other types of cannabis is uh, species like THC versus CBD versus combination. And also uh, we should know that there are uh, different formulations of cannabis. For example, topical, tincture, edible, uh, like candy or chocolate, smoke, Ink and vaporing. So based on several guidelines, it says non-recommended to third line treatment options. So like opioid, we don't have uh, sufficient data. So again, just looking at uh, the study designs, uh, there are so many biases to evaluate the uh, efficacy and safety of cannabis. So uh, personally, I'm not against the use of uh, TCA or CBD for uh, pain management. However, as a pharmacist, I do have a concern, uh, actually two concerns. So adverse reactions and drug interactions. So for adverse reactions, um, cannabis could cause uh, CNS adverse reactions such as a sleepiness, drowsiness, and then also LFT elevation. Yeah, so uh, if you talk with your patient, patient may say cannabis is a miracle drug, no side effect, 
or no drug, drug interactions. Yeah, it's, it's really common. It's really common misunderstanding, right? But yeah, cannabis does cause uh, adverse reactions. And then uh, drug cannabis interactions. So uh, cannabis works as an enzyme inhibitor. So when you combine uh, cannabis with specific medications, supplement, it could uh, interfere, uh, it, it could increase or decrease the serum concentration of other medications. Then um, speaking of LFT elevation, if patient is on valproic acid for seizures or for neuropathic pain, and then combine with CBD or cannabis, then LFT elevation is one of the common side effect. Okay, so let's move on to step three. So um, once we initiate the drug therapy and we need to reassess the pain status and also the therapy you initiated. So for the pain, uh, usually we assess the quality of the pain and the quantity of the pain. And we can always reset the treatment goal. And then for the pharmacotherapy, um, again, we can combine pharmacotherapy option or non-pharmacotherapy options for neuropathic pain. And we need to evaluate whether the medication you selected is effective or not effective, and whether you need uh, the dose adjustment. And also you need to assess whether we should try a different first line medication. So we talked about the concomitant disease state and uh, I listed some um, disease state and what medication may be appropriate considering those concomitant disease state. For example, if patient is obese, uh, I would avoid valproic acid because valproic acid can uh, cause weight gain and may be beneficial uh, if you prescribe topiramate. So topiramate, uh, this is anticonvulsant and the topiramate can cause weight loss. Sometimes topiramate can uh, change the taste, but it could cause weight loss. And patient with epilepsy, uh, maybe patient can benefit from anti-epileptic drugs. And then uh, if patient has migraine headache, topiramate may be beneficial because topiramate has good evidence to treat migraine, head uh, migraine uh, headache. And anxiety, you can choose gabapentin or pregabalin because it has uh, un, uh, because um, it has anxiolytic effect, and then depression, of course, SNR, uh, SNRI, and sleep issues, um, gabapentin, pregabalin, TCAs. Those are very sedative, so uh, we can try those. And then for geriatric patients, it's better to avoid uh, TCAs. And finally, uh, we need to assess whether goals are met with uh, the current medication. And then uh, these are the pain-specific comorbidities we can assess. Uh, depression, so depression status can exacerbate uh, the pain condition. And also some patients may develop hypothyroidism and hypogonadism, low vitamin D, obesity, and sleep apnea. Uh, and also we can assess PTSD or we can assess uh, history of uh, sexual or physical abuse. And then we can refer the patient to a psych uh, psychologist or psychiatri uh, psychiatrist to assess and treat those conditions. So this table shows the summary of which medication can uh, use for which disease state. For example, let's take a look at anxiety. So anxiety, I put uh, plus, plus. So again, uh, gabapentin is good for uh, anxiety. So it's highly recommended or preferred. 
And T, uh, SNRIs, uh, venlafaxine or duloxetine, it's also a good option. So as milnacipline and TCAs also. So here, uh, cardiac disease, let's say arrhythmia. So for arrhythmia, um, TCAs. So we discussed that TCA uh, can increase the risk of QT prolongation. So it is contraindicated. How about uh, SNRIs? It's judgmental. So uh, when to assess, uh, when to determine uh, the efficacy of the medication for uh, pain. So typically, as you see the guideline, four to six weeks after the initiation of the medication. So we uh, need to assess efficacy and safety. And then step four is consideration or initiation of other treatment options. So um, if the first line medication is good for the patient, um, he or she can stay on that medication. But um, we may need to add uh, or switch to another medication. So it's always a good option to refer the patient to a multidisciplinary pain team. And then um, if none of the medication works, we can consider the trial of opioid medications. Okay, so. Uh, these are the references I use for this presentation. And I created some questions. Okay, so let's work on uh, three questions. So this is your uh, patient. Okay, so 58 year old male has diabetic, uh, diabetic neuropathy. So uh, let's assume this patient has not tried any medications. And uh, these are the today's uh, lab result. So for this case, which is the best medication? So A, gabapentin, B, gabapentin plus duloxetine, C, sartreline, D, bupolic acid or dibupolix, E, morphine. Okay, so I heard A. Yes, A is the right answer. Because uh, gabapentin, this is a first line medication, and B, it's uh, gabapentin plus duloxetine. So, patient is medication naive at this point. So, we should try first line medication first, and then uh, we need to assess whether the first line medication would work. I mean, first line monotherapy would work for this patient. Uh, certainly, again, patient has not tried any first line medications. Uh, same reason for bupolic acid, morphine. So we talked about opioid and opioid is not a uh, uh, good option as a first line medication. Okay, All right. Yeah, so this is uh, the algorithm, how to choose a uh, unappropriate neuropathic pain, pain, uh, neuropathic pain medications. Okay. So the second question. So you decided to prescribe gabapentin for this patient. Uh, select the appropriate dosing regimen of gabapentin and monitoring the parameters of gabapentin and the neuropathic pain. So uh, your target dose is 900 milligrams PO three times a day. Okay, so I heard B, okay, I heard E. Anything else, B or E, E as an elephant? Okay, so my answer is E. <laughs> so the reason is, uh, so first of all, the term, I get those uh, 900 milligram um, TID, that's too high as a starting dose. 
So remember, the gold standard is start slow and go slow. So uh, dosage-wise, gabapentin 300 milligram once a day and increase the dose gradually. And then uh, monitor patient peripheral edema because this is a kind of common side effect from uh, gabapentin. And lastly, uh, we'll monitor patient glucose control. So this patient has diabetes. So what if patient uh, diabetes condition is bad? It could exacerbate the um, neuropathic pain condition. So the answer is E. Okay, so the last question. <laughs> Right. So um, patient uh, started gabapentin and now the dosage is uh, 1200 milligrams three times a day. And he was able to exercise, but suddenly he started having shooting pain. So, um, and then in addition to that, his PCP found an abnormal ventricular conduction about three weeks ago. So at this point, which uh, which of the following medications in his medications would be recommended? So A, continue current regimen. B, increase gabapentin dose. Uh, C, switch to amitriptyline. D, uh, switch to duloxetine. Uh, e, switch to tramadol. Okay, uh, I heard A, continue current regimen. Anything else? Okay, I heard B. Anything else? You said D? D? Okay, so let's take a look at it. So uh, my answer is uh, D. So the reason is here, gabapentin 1200 milligram TID. Actually, this is a max dose of gabapentin. So that means even though patient is on the max dosage of gabapentin, it's not working. So um, at this point, A and B is not an option. So here, patient has abnormal ventricular conduction. So uh, with this information, which medication should we avoid? Yeah, amitriptyline because TCA has uh, cardiotoxicity. And then how about the tramadol? So this is a second line medication. So at this point, I would like to uh, choose first line medication first. And then if it doesn't work or a patient is not tolerate with the uh, the medication, and then I would move to tramadol. But uh, just given information, my answer is D. Okay. That's a good question. So uh, again, gabapentin, uh, 1200 milligrams TID. Uh, this is a max dose. So uh, if we continue gabapentin, patients should be on the medication which is not working. So which could increase the risk of uh, other side effects. Yeah, that's why it's better to switch off to other medication. So uh, in this case, what uh, we need to do is we need to decrease the gabapentin dose uh, gradually. Okay, so the reason is if you uh, discontinue gabapentin right away, patient may experience withdrawal symptoms. Okay, so this is the end of my presentation. So do you have any other questions about neuropathic pain? Yes. I, I, I was researching this to find because I have a patient who's taking medical cannabis that I have prescribed, but um, any problems with the long QT syndrome or make that worse if they have long QT? What syndrome? Long QT. Long QT. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know much about the cardiac effect on. Is there any research on, hmm? there any research on that? 
To be honest, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. I would just add under the adverse effects of cannabis, the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, I've been seeing a lot of my patients on medical cannabis end up in the ER for the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And I'd rather have chronic pain than the hyperemesis. It looks really awful, so. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else? I think that's it. Thank you, Makiko. That was great. Thank you for your attention.